Okay, well, <laughs> you got their attention. Um, I my glasses, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we have uh, Lawrence and Lauren Mead to present tonight about tactics and strategy. So last year, we actually split this up into two evenings, um, but uh, you're going to do a good job of putting it together into one evening. So, uh, away Thanks you go. Thank you very much. Away we go. This is all based on something that was done for Lauren. So when I was asked to do tactics and strategy, I thought, well, how do I break down what is a pretty huge subject into something that's manageable? I mean, tactics. You can talk about tactics for three or four hours, and you can never cover every tactical situation that everyone's going to find. So I thought, right, we'll, we'll, we'll use the two words, tactics and strategy. And when Lauren was about 13, she used to race toppers, topper dinghies in England, on all the little lakes up and down, and we used to put two toppers on the roof and go off and race. And I used to stand on the shore and think, oh, why is she doing that? <laughs> and as a function of doing that, I wrote um, what you will see in a minute, Dad's 10, ten top tips of sailing, of race sailing or something, I can't remember what I called it now. But I wrote out, okay guys, this is what you've really got to focus on, because I had two children trying to get them to focus, focus, focus. And I decided that this evening what we would try to do is to keep it simple, because um, the problem with sailing is it's extremely complicated. But it's actually relatively simple, because the same people keep winning time and time again, so it can't be that complicated. The people who win are not any more intelligent or anything else than the people who don't. So there must be something about it which is relatively simple, even though we all think it's massively complicated. So I sort of started out by saying, okay, the truth is when it comes to sailboat races, it's actually pretty straightforward. Get a good start, sail fast, and stay out of trouble. How many people in the room can honestly say that they can do that every week? I.e., be in the first two boats or three boats off the start line. If you're in the first three boats off the start line, if you sail fast and stay out of trouble, you're going to be in pretty decent shape. A typical race, the start gun goes. 25% of the fleet will have trouble getting off the line. Fact. 25% of the fleet, another 25% of the fleet, will have trouble keeping their lane, i.e. keeping clear wind, in the next two or three minutes. So, if a boat practiced nothing at all but starting and boat speed, you'd have a great chance of being in the top half of the fleet within a minute and a half, two minutes. So there's no reason why everybody in the room here shouldn't plan on being within the first half of the fleet every single race two or three minutes in. And I don't think any of us can say that we actually do that. I mean, starting is more complicated. There are some other issues there. But that has to be a goal that we think about trying to achieve. So simple that sailing is quite simple in that respect. Um, I wanted to focus on trying to keep it simple. The whole point about tonight is to try to come up with good, hard rules of the road that will make sure that our tactics and our strategy are, are better. And it was given to me as tactics for <coughs> strategy second, so I've actually done it that way. Okay. I, I finished off by saying, try to get out of your mind, try to get out of your mind the idea that sailing is an impossible sport. We all get stuck in a pecking order. Okay, my position in the fleet is 7th, my position is 11th. When I go to the actual worlds, I've been four times, I've finished 9th, 9th, 10th and 11th. That's a pecking order, I'm stuck between 9th and 11th. Why can't I be 4th? Ideally 1st, but 4th would be better than 11th. So let's try and get out of, our, out of our mind the idea that we're stuck where we are. Okay, so I'm going to do tactics first. Um, I'm going to run through this reasonably quickly. I suggest if anyone's got any questions as we go, we do questions on the way rather than at the end. So three types of wind shifts. Permanent comes in, the wind shift comes in and never goes back. Oscillating, the wind goes one way and then the other. And persistent, slowly going one way. On top of that, there are wind bends and wind holes. We're going to ignore wind bends and wind holes um, partly because Jamie did such a great job of the wind bend in the harbour in his previous presentation. I think 
If you haven't seen that, it is on the internet. It's a really good presentation about the wind bend up the harbour. You need to know which type of wind you're sailing in. I've, a, a great example in the harbour is a northerly. When the wind comes over the top of Kowloon Peak, it can either come just left of the peak, in which case the wind is always north. The wind's always coming out of the north, and the only issue is to try to make sure you're the first one into a northerly puff of wind, and you get it. Those are, are persistent wind shifts. They're always going to come from that side. The second option is when you've got a northerly and an easterly slightly fighting each other. You've got an easterly coming down the harbour in the normal direction. You've got a northerly coming over the top. Um, in those scenarios, in that scenario, you've got an oscillating breeze. It's a dramatic example. Okay, I mean, you could, in a minute, we'll talk about small oscillation, but in that scenario, you've got two different breezes completely, and you've got two different times when you can be going either east in a northerly or north in an easterly. And you've just got to make sure that you're picking the right oscillation. Is the wind now out of here, or is the wind now out of here? Now, obviously, if you're out on an Olympic race course, you'll find much smaller wind shifts. You'll find two, three, four, five degrees. And you might even find an oscillating wind shift that you can actually time. Okay, it's moving from 180 degrees to 200 degrees every eight or nine minutes. It sounds impossible that the wind actually does generate those firm patterns, but it does. If you actually sail along enough before the start of the race, sometimes you can find those oscillations. You need to know which type of wind you're sailing in to know what your tactics should be. Because obviously if the wind is going to go persistently one way, and it's just going to go one way all the whole day, you've got a whole different set of um, responses to that, to if the wind is going to shift backwards and forwards. Just as a very basic picture, there's the top mark, there's the start line. If the wind starts here, straight up, and you'd have to tack all, your, all the way up, if it's, only, if it's going to do one shift 20 degrees this way and stay there, once you're down here, you've done your tack off, once the wind has lifted, and you're now setting this angle in your boat, you'll never get another header on the wind for this angle to, to come back so you can tack over. Difference between a persistent shift and oscillating shift. So it's very important you identify which one it is you're sailing at any one time. That may have been the wrong button. Tactics. So you tack sooner, do you? <clears throat> you tack, you tack. If, if you think the wind is going to stay in that direction, and you're down here, and all, all of your competitors are here. They've so obviously got an advantage over you. So you're being there you. In which case, you say, OK, the wind is never going to come back. I'm never going to get a chance to tack. I'll time my tack based on a, a better wind or better tide or something else. But you can give up on the no, idea. Right. So you're not going to get that upside. You're not going to get any upside. Upside's gone. However, if the wind oscillates back this way, you would get a header. And all of a sudden, when you tacked, you're back in the game. So you, you, you'd only tack if there's some other reason to it. You'd only tack for some other reason to tack, exactly. exactly. The other big thing about tactics, which is what we're talking about, is stick to the middle of the race course. Um, <laughs> typical problem. It's really good advice everywhere, except Hong Kong Harbour and Lama. <laughs> Tactically, however, if you sail anywhere other than out there, stick to the middle of the race course, learn to love the middle, is a very, very important part of tactics. And in a minute we're going to talk about why. Um, I've included in that statement uh, a famous line from a famous tactician, which is called, cross them when you can. Um, I'll tell you why. If you all come off a start line, you're all even assuming you all get an even start and you follow the instructions on the previous page, which is about getting a good start <coughs> every time. If the wind heads, so you're now at this angle, 
Obviously, the boats <coughs> down here have an advantage. The top mark is up here. You've got to get back to the middle of the race course. <coughs> okay? You don't know when the next header is going to come. So if God delivers up a little header and you can cross most of the fleet, the best thing you can do is tack and bank your gain. It's only a gain when you're getting back to the middle of the race course. I'm going to jump a little bit. There's a thing in here which is called headers win races, not lifts. You've got to get your head around this because it's really important. Any header means you can tack over, sail on a nice angle on the other side, back towards the middle. And the middle is always safe and always good because the top mark is, theoretically, in the middle of the race course. The problem with a lift is that it's, it's not allowing you to get back to the middle. Let's say that you're this boat here, or let's say you're this boat here, and you get lifted. Let's say the wind comes and your angle improves. So the wind's gone from here over to here. That's great, but just like the bloke that's to lured of you, how do you ever get back to the mark? People go looking for lifts, I'm lifted, that must be a good thing. It's only a good thing if you're in the middle of the race course, and it's only a good thing if it stops. Because otherwise, you just do this. Right round, right round the mark. You actually need to be looking for headers, not lifts. Any header that you get changes your course that way. You can tack back to the middle. Learn to love the middle. Everybody wants lifts. Actually, you want headers. Okay, got to get your head around the reverse being true. We were all brought up to believe that lifts were good. There was even a boat called Hitchhiker, which was a picture of a man with a thumb out was the name of the boat Hitchhiker because they were always looking for lifts. And I thought, that's a bit strange because actually what you want is headers. Has everyone got, got that concept? Very important. And also, I presume if you finish up on the other side of the course, the same rule applies. Correct. If you're on the reverse side, it also applies. The wind is from here, and the wind shifts to here, so your, your heading heads away from the mark. There's your boat. That header is fantastic because it allows you to get back towards the middle. Worst case scenario is you get to either side and you get a lift. How the hell do you ever get back? But you have to get back because the mark's in the middle. So at what point do you bail out from the good lift that you're in? and accepting that you might never get a header to get back across to the middle. How do, you, how do you pick that point? You need to decide whether you're in a pers persistent shift. Say it's persistent. Or an os oscillating shift. Okay, oscillating you can afford to wait, but if it's persistent, what do you, you know, when do you bite the bullet? <coughs> Especially in the harbour. Th that is the $64,000 question. And the reason this, this talk, tactics and strategy, is difficult is because some days it pays to tack off a persistent shift because there's less tide or more tide or better wind or whatever else. And sometimes it pays to hang on in a persistent shift. So it's very hard to give you every example in a, conversa in a talk about what the choice should be. If it was that easy, it would be like playing a computer game. Computers will never, ever, ever, ever win a boat race because no two conditions are ever the same. Mr. Smith at the back of the room has sailed more boat races than almost all of us combined. How many times have you sailed exactly the same race twice, Colin? Never. It just doesn't happen. So you have to focus, and this is where my dad's 10 rules of sailing for Lauren came up. Stick to the basics, stick to the rules, stick to the averages, stick to the, the, the golden rules and you won't go too far wrong. You won't win every race, but that isn't your objective. Your objective is to be somewhere in the first 12, 15, 20% of the fleet. If you can do that, your, your average will be high enough that you'll do very well in the school. 505 Europeans in uh, September. How many races did we have? 12 or 13? Yeah, probably. 13, I think it was. You can't get 13 races right. It's impossible. 13 races, 3 laps, 35 beats, 35 runs. All you can do is try not to make too many mistakes and uh, keep somewhere near the top of the game. Same out here. You know, Jamie is probably Jamie McWilliams is probably the best guy around the harbour. He doesn't get it right every time. It's impossible. Okay, I've got an hour, and I've got to cover quite a few things. So I'm going to move on to.
boat about tactics. It's the one thing that m what? <laughs> give me give me grief. <laughs> so you got forty minutes on now. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Boat about tactics. I think when we use the word tactics, that's what most people think we're going to talk about. So I thought it was worth covering some points in that area. How many people on port, sorry, how many people on starboard tack, when they're on starboard, have actually stood up and looked at a boat coming across them on port, about to have a collision? <coughs> this is you. All the rights, that's you, not you, because you're on, that's you. <laughs> that guy's on port. <laughs> This is you, happily going along on starboard tack. You've got all the rights. This guy's definitely got to get over your way. How many people have actually stood up and said to this guy on port, come on, you can go, carry on. I know you can't get across me. I know I've got all the rights, but I'll let you go. How many people have done that? Put your hand up. Okay, not everybody. There is a time almost in every race where you do not want to force this guy to tack. You want to let this guy go. Just let him cross. And if you have to bear away to go behind him a little bit, bear away. Let him go. Okay, if you force him to tack, what's he going to do? He's got to tack right here in front of you. You're the loser if you're trying to go that way. He's just going to block off your path by giving you dirty breeze, dirty wind. So if you want to go that way, the very best thing you can do is say, go on, mate, carry on, carry on. Even if you have to bear away behind him. I was sailing the Etchell in the harbour a couple of years ago, and another class of boat, a little one, was doing half hour speed, and his mark was here. My mark was here. And I had a whole bunch of Etchells all stacked up here. I wasn't doing very well. They were all... If I'd fallen down here by going behind him, I would have been in their dirty wind, which I really didn't want to do. So this little boat, which is doing half my speed, starts shouting starboard. I said, can I cross? Can I carry on? Starboard. Can I, can I cross? Starboard. Oh, sugar. Okay. So in the end, to avoid a crash, I had to tack right in front of this guy. Gave him all my dirty wind, because I'm going twice as fast. I went eight seconds this way and tacked back again. In the meantime, this boat, which had been on starboard, had suffered all the dirty wind that I, I, you know, I'd put onto him. All he had to do was wave me across, do a little duck behind, carry on. He could have still made his mark easily. I was on port. I had the obligation to keep clear. But it would have made a lot more sense for him to let me cross. So you really need to be thinking about your thinking ahead brain. What's happening in this situation? What do I want to happen? What do I want to happen for my boat? What's the best thing I can do, rather than just necessarily forcing your, your rights on somebody? Oops, too many buttons there. Number, the next one. Never, ever, ever come round outside somebody at the leeward mark. Here's the mark. Here's the three boat length circle. You're all coming down, the wind's from here. You're all coming down with the spinnakers up. This guy here has got water on you. You're gonna go around the mark this way. This guy here's got water on you. You've actually got to slow down. Take the spinnaker down. Pull the sails in so that the boat slows down. Whatever it takes, you do not want to round this mark here. You're dead. You've got all the dirty wind spilling off him onto you. You can't tack because you'll hit him here if you do. And there's virtually no tactical options open to you. So that is a complete and utter no-no. You absolutely must come round right on his tail here. Even if you slow up and let him go, which is what you'll have to do. You let him go round into there, you come round, do a nice tight turn behind him. Slow up and be in a better position 40 seconds later than you would otherwise be. I see so many people go round the bottom, 
fighting in this position to get the spinnaker down, hoping that somehow, miraculously, they're going to have a 747 jet engine scoop right around the outside, right onto here. Oh, I'm winning. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Just accept it. Nothing you can do about it. The guy's ahead of you. Slow up and win. This is another classic situation. Think about where you want to be on the run before you round the top mark, the windward mark. Charging through the Bolivian rainforest here. The Amazon rainforest. Here's the windward mark. Two boats approaching on the ley line. On starboard, the wind's here. Okay? The tide, let's say for the sake of argument, is ripping this way. Okay? There's a nice shore down this side. Classic. And for the actuals, we do it in Shocky One mark all the time. Where do you want to be with this tide ripping up here? You absolutely want to be down the shore, getting out of the tide. As this guy comes round into this position, you have the option, because you're just behind him, of either making sure your bow is in there, or you can sometimes get overlapped outside. If you allow your boat to get into this position, even by one foot, let's say he's there, and you, your bow is trapped by one foot there, you're snookered. He will decide for you when you get to the shore. You can't jive before him. He's on starboard, you're snookered. So you have to think about slowing up in this situation. Maybe this is only a couple of feet. Just slow up a second, just let him go. Give him some space. Let him get round. As he comes round and gets to here, you come round, do a nice big bear away, and get yourself tucked in this side of the guy or girl. Your option then is first to the shore, out of the tide, you've got the tactical advantage over this guy. But you can only do that in your pre plan. Okay? All these things happen multiple times in a race. If you've got three laps, you've got three women marks and three lured marks, every one of them is an opportunity to do it right or to do it wrong. And I guarantee you, we, do, we don't get it all right. I'm going to give you another example, which my brother reminded me of. We had in the Exel Champs a couple of years ago. Again, it's about thinking ahead. Windward mark is here. You're approaching on starboard. Wind is from here somewhere. And you've got a whole bunch of guys come behind you on port. Let's say that the three boat length circle is here somewhere. Your problem is that you're on starboard. When you go up here and tack, because you're not, you're not laying it, you can't get to the mark, you tack onto, star, onto port, they come along, do the opposite. When you get to the critical moment, you're in trouble. You're the one on port tack. They're the ones on starboard tack. You end up having to duck behind them and tack. So you've gone from ahead to behind. So you've got to be thinking about it and saying, okay, what's going to happen here? How's this all going to work out? As you come across them, you instead tack here. You leave them out this way, and it means you're doing two quick tacks. You're giving up speed, you're giving up time, you're definitely hurting your momentum in the race. But tactically, you're putting yourself in a position that when you all then get to this point, they can't actually tack because they'll hit you. You're they can't just tack onto starboard and hit you. So you get to this point, you tack, and you lead in round the top, and they all have to come in behind you. Again, it's thinking forward, trying to figure out what's going to, what's going to happen. And as I've been thinking, I've just thought of one really good example to talk about. This start line that we have during the opening regatta, start line's here, yacht club's here, we're in a westerly, and often the westerly comes down at this sort of angle. So the, down the harbour is this way, and the first mark is often Hong Hong. Okay? 
absolutely crystal clear that when you're sailing on this leg, running down to that point, you're going to be on port jibe. Yeah? If the, mark wasn't, if the start line wasn't there, from here to here, the wind is on the port side. The problem is that the start line is here, and everybody wants to be on starboard for safety before the start. So you see, I'm sure you've all seen this, you see all the boats on starboard tack, jilling up over just out here, waiting for the gun, at which case the point they all turn around and jibe and head off this way. Clearly the best place to start is right here, because you'll then be the windward boat getting the breeze first. This happened exactly oh, 18 months ago, whenever it was. So think ahead. The problem for these guys is that nobody can jibe because the boat behind is on starboard. So if, if as the start gun goes, this man, this, this boat here bears away, none, no one here can jibe. Right? Because these guys are on starboard. <coughs> if they jibe over onto port tack, they'll be in the wrong. So the place to start is last. You want to be the last boat in this train approaching the mark from Chimsa Choi into here. Because even if you're a bit late, it doesn't matter. No one's going to be able to jive in front of you as long as you're tight up behind them. So you actually want to come in here late, 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 get here five seconds after the gun. Everybody will be waiting for the first person in the, or the back of the train to come around and jive onto port. And then they can go, go in, a, in a queue. And it absolutely happens like that. Nick Burns pulled it off. He was the last guy. I was the next one. I think Marty K was in front of me. None of us could jive until Nick got there. So starting last looked like a disaster. All these people thought, oh, I'm on the line, I'm on the line. These guys out here are late. But in reality, they actually had a tactical advantage over us because they pre-thought what was going to happen. So it's another good example where a bit of pre-thinking, a bit of planning, will put you in good shape. Position to be the inside boat at the bottom mark from quite a long way out. Halfway down the run, if you've got a running leg, not a reaching leg, you want to be thinking, how the hell do I become the inside boat so I've got the opportunity to round smoothly rather than being the outside boat. And you'll see at, at top level, you'll see people weaving all over, them, all, all over the place down the run, trying to make sure that they're the inside boat of 8, 9, 10, 15 boats rafted up huge advantage. Think well ahead and start positioning. I'm going to run past that one quite quickly because I've still got a lot to cover. Don't get to the lay line too early. If you go back a couple of pages, let's use this one. Let's say you're all comfortable. This is the, the two lay lines, okay? This is the guy on port. This is the guy on starboard. They're approaching this mark upwind. Once you're on this ley line, if you do it 500 meters out, you've got no tactical opportunities for 500 meters. The only thing you can do for half a kilometer is sail straight at that mark. Doesn't matter if the wind lifts, doesn't matter if the wind heads, doesn't matter if someone tacks on top of you, doesn't matter if you get a hole in the wind, there's nothing you can do because you're already pinned into these ley lines. Anybody inside you in the middle of the race course can say, oh, there's a hole in the wind there, I'm approaching it. I can either tap and avoid it, or I can even bear away a little bit if I want to, power through the hole, and avoid, avoid problems. Whereas on the ley line, you're completely pinned, so avoid the ley lines. Oops, too many buttons. <coughs> and maybe the same one. I'm going to skip this one very quickly. Dirty air is a massive hindrance. If you're in dirty air, you've got to do almost anything you can to get out of it. Way too many people in the harbour, particularly in the slower boats where the dirty air is even worse, spend much too long time sitting in disturbed air from the boats ahead. 
almost always worth getting out of it, even if it's taking you slightly the wrong way. Even if you're going into slightly more tide or whatever, it's almost always worth getting out. This is the point that we actually covered before about lead back to the header, stay in the middle. Everyone got the head around that particular point? The header being the most important thing. Downwind, the opposite of it is true. On an upwind leg, when you get headed, you tack off a header. On a downwind leg, you jive off a lift. Okay, the wind's there. Let's say that the mark is not here. Let's say that the mark is down here. If you've got a header, i.e. the wind went round to here, your angle to the mark would be closer to the, to the buoy. Because obviously as the wind shifts that way, your boat moves that way, your, your, your wind angle means the boat moves that way, you're heading straight to the mark. If the wind was to lift, alternatively, in order to keep the wind straight behind you, you end up sailing away from the mark. And that's your opportunity to jive back to the middle. Because the principle about staying in the middle still applies. So you're looking for, you're looking for situations where the wind is lifting you. The wind X, instead of being straight behind you, starts to mean you're running by the lee. That's your opportunity to jive and go back to the middle. Okay? I know you all want to get to Dad's top ten secrets of sailing, that's why we're all... I have there, Richard, any idea? No idea. <laughs> Right, and then we're just finishing this little section on tactics. After every mark, focus on boat speed and the race course and do the housekeeping, the tidying up, the pulling the spinnaker sheets in, the stowing the whatever it is that needs stowing, the putting the water bottles away. Do all that last. Get the boat moving as fast as you can and hike hard. Doesn't matter which boat you're in, we said it when we were doing the starting talk, doesn't matter which boat you're in, get the people to sit out harder. We just came back from King's Cup last week and my son was on a boat ahead of us and he came in after every day and said, we're on a 40, 40 foot boat. Wow, the guys on your boat don't hike very hard, Dad. On a 40 footer it makes a difference. I'm gonna skip that one. Right. Focus, make life as simple as you possibly can. The way I wrote this out for Lauren, and she's, she's going to talk about the things that she has learned trying to follow those rules. Um, do all of these things all of the time and you won't be far away from the front of the fleet. That's what I told her when I pushed her out into little lakes in, in top of dinghies. Rule one, get a good start. Simple, easy, winning from the front with clear air is a lot easier than fighting in dirty air. This means planning for a good start, putting in 10 minutes preparatory before every race. Some of you may have come to the starting talk that, that I gave last year. There is something on the internet that Rich has got up, which was a cheat sheet, how to, how to start better. We're not going to do starting today, but we've got to be able to get a good start. If you can't start, you'll never, ever win a race. So it's always worth going out and figuring out how to get a better start. If anyone wants directions to that uh, talk from last year, I think it's still up, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, it's still on the seminar yeah. page. Yeah. It's on the Yacht Club webpage. Can I interrupt? Certainly. You put more time and effort into organising the start than anybody else I have ever seen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of my golden rules. I even pass it to my daughter. So. But maybe, maybe Lauren should just say how she, how she then took that and interpreted it on the race course. Uh, from a dinghy point of view, I ended up working out a really set routine of things that I wanted to do when I was in when I was in topless, but then in races afterwards, um, of kind of a set number of um, exercises and routines I would sail around the race course and start to get 
all the information I felt I needed to be prepared by the time the start gun went. So that involved um, starting up by going into the middle of the line, putting the bow up into the wind and checking to see which end of the line was favoured. And then I'd go to the committee boat end first, which would let you double check your race course or you know, any of the details they might have had up on the committee boat. Um, and also let you get a transit down the line rather than sailing to the pin first. So I would just have a particular routine that I would follow and a sort of mental checklist to make sure I'd done everything. And then when I moved into big boats and I started doing nav, it was, it's the same sort of thing, it's just a different routine because um, you check that you know, the battery's got enough power in the, at the five minute gun so you're not going to be running downstairs and miss something at a critical moment or something like that basically. So um, yeah, the way that I decided I'd get the best start would be to have this routine and really follow it meticulously. You could write your own routine down and have literally pull the piece of paper up when they're starting a 747 engine, they have a list of checklist, checklist, make your own starting checklist. Okay, every start, pull a bit of paper up, get someone to read it out. Do we know which end is favoured? To find out. Do we know where the tide's going? Do we know how long there is to go? You know, all those things come into the checklist. R rule two, have a plan for the race. A way up the first beat and a decent understanding of what the tide, the wind and the tide are doing. Divide up the job so that somebody comes with that data in writing. Certainly on my brother's actual, Sue always turns up with the tide, the flow chart, the wind forecast, all in writing, even though last week they got it back to front. But it was better than having a plan than no plan. Better to have a plan that is wrong than not a plan at all. Um, and then from the way that I sort of interpreted that when I was still um, doing dinghies and stuff, was, and also big boats actually, is, is literally as soon as I leave the dock, I start watching what the wind's doing so that by the time I actually get out to the race course, I have a really strong idea of exactly as Dad was saying earlier, is it going persistently one way, is it trending left or right? Um, and particularly on the big boat, because I kind of tend to have pens and paper and stuff on me, I then do write that down so that you can really track it as you go out to the race course, because it might take you 40 minutes to get to the race course or an hour, and you can get a really good idea of what the wind's doing in that time. So it's worth kind of having a game plan before you even start going into your start sequence. Rule three, be fast. You can never win a boat race going slow. You don't have to be the fastest boat on the race course, but you have to be somewhat fast. And you have to figure out how you're going to, if you think you're not going fast, you've got to figure out how to be fast. Um, there are two parts to this. One part is investing time and money to make sure that you're fast before you leave the dock. Newish sails from the right sail maker. With, with the rig tuned to, to rough, you know, to the right place. Um, you should have a, a set of tuning numbers so that you know, okay, in strong winds we have the force stay at this length, the shroud tensions at this length. How, how detailed you want to get is entirely up to you. But um, in the top boats, in things like Etchels and 505s, um, everything's on a spreadsheet. Everybody knows how long the force stay is, how tight the shrouds are, where the bottom of the mast is, and they change it for all the different wind strengths. You don't have to go that complicated, but you at least have to have some basic settings. Even if it's only vang tension, you know, boom vang tension, main sheet tension, and backstay tension. I think every boat we race, except Flying 15s, on a Saturday has got a backstay. Is that right? Well, yeah, just Flying 15s, right? Every boat that's got a backstay needs to have a calibrated scale on the backstay of knowing how much tension they've got on it. So that when you're going fast, oh, that's a good setting in this much wind. Or when you're going slow, that's a less good setting. Okay, so you've got to be fast. If, you, if you're not fast, you get nowhere. Well, the only thing I'm talking about there is two boat tuning. Uh, yeah, I used to do a lot of um, two boat tra tuning pretty much for every class I think that I've ever sailed in. Just find someone that you buddy up with and go out. Even if it's actually just before a race and you're just two boat tuning on the way to the start line, you can check that all your settings are right for the day. But particularly if you do have time to go out and practice and really get into a routine of sailing with someone that you don't have to be nice to them on the race course, you can still like, race against them as hard as you could, but, <laughs> but there's, it's just a really good way, it's not a way of finding out someone's weaknesses particularly, it's just a way of really doing useful constructive criticism basically and, and learning from each other. So. In the actuals, no one would ever line up for a, for a race, almost any race, without having first found somebody who's sailing, diving in next to them and practicing boat speed. Even at world championship level, the blokes that think they're going to win the world championship will go out and the first thing they'll do, get their sails trimmed up to all their marks, find somebody and start lining up against them. Am I, am I fast or am I slow? Do I need to change my settings 
based on you know, the performance I've got against this boat next to us. Oh, high card. What's that one? High card. I like this, this is good. <laughs> Everyone got high card, right? Especially Rita in the 470. <laughs> okay, rule four, watch the wind. The next shift, your position relative to your competitors on the course at all times. Um, you can learn a huge amount by watching the boats around you, whether they're faster, more wind, less wind, you're gaining on them, they're gaining on you. And uh, Lauren worked out the big difference between guys at the front and guys at the back is the people at the front are looking at it from the top down. It's, it's like having this um, chart or a chessboard, whatever you want to call it, in your head that you're looking at and you learn to kind of position people and the wind in your head in such a way that you have this really big picture view of the whole race course as you're going along. But it's something I only really learned to do in the last couple of years and Dad's been saying it to me for at least 10 years. So um, it, it's really good when you can figure out how... And you can just see a couple of moves ahead, basically, and the only way that I've found you can do that is by looking from the top down onto the course, and then you can start positioning where people are and, and anticipate what's going to happen next. Because otherwise, you're just so focused on what's going to happen in the next manoeuvre and the, the very next move that you can't see, like, two moves down the track. So it's quite difficult, well, I found it quite difficult to do, actually, just to get used to it. But once it kind of, once it kind of clicks, it, it's really good. It's worth trying to think like that when you're racing the whole time. Imagine you're in a helicopter, you're not on the boat. Imagine the whole world from 400 feet up. Think about the wind shift, the tides, the other boats, and exactly as Lauren says. Rule five, sail smoothly with what you have. You can't change the wind, but you can trim the sails to the conditions. It's all, everyone's seen the poster, right? You can't change the wind, you can only change the sails. But it is very, very true. There's no point in worrying about where you are. You are where you are. You can't pick this boat up transport it across to the other side of the harbour where there's more wind and suddenly be there. What you can do is say, how the hell am I going to get from here to wherever the next advantage is going to be? Because although the advantage may be over there right now, it probably isn't going to stay there. It's probably going to move somewhere else. And you've got to position yourself thinking as a helicopter, I'm here, but I actually want to be there. Because in two or three minutes, I think that's where the advantage will be. I, I just one thing on that. I think that the head out of the boat thing is the biggest weakness that club sailors all over the world have that I can reference to. Because the good sailors, they head out of the boat and they are looking around the whole time. I mean, it happens very often that you you we had it on our boat where I asked somebody to watch another boat and they they couldn't find that boat on the racetrack even though they were told where it was. And you. you you're like, you've got to have your head out of the boat, and the good guys can head out of the boat and analyse what's going on. But I think for all of us, if we all look up, analyse, get that helicopter view, we'll all we'll have a much better chance of, of getting to the right place ahead on the racetrack. We're all very weak at it, I think. Rule six, <coughs> keep doing the right things. Don't go chasing the dream. In sailing, it very, very rarely happens that everybody else is wrong and you're right, it doesn't matter who you are, actually, the majority of the time, you just got a sail or percentage game. If you can't overtake the guy ahead of you, you can't overtake the guy ahead of you. Hoping to spear off into some strange location or do something clever with some sail, almost never works. So keep sailing the percentage game. In the, average, in the end, the averages will come good. As a good example, in one of the actual races, in fact, it was the same race as that start we had here. The mark we were going to was here. The, the wind is here. So we're all sailing down on port, no problem at all. We're not quite going to have enough wind and the right angle to get down to the mark. But from here to here was, I don't know, six minutes. So halfway down, one of the boats in the first three jived and headed off in this direction. I'm thinking, why the hell would you want to do that? You'd have to be really, 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 really sure that to sail this angle away from this mark when everybody else is nearly on a straight course to it, you'd have to be damn sure there was an advantage here. There wasn't, and that boat went from top three to you know nearly last. 
So just the basics, jiving off the longest leg to the mark, or tacking off the longest leg to the mark, you need a good reason to do it. If all the fleet's going that way as well, don't, what, you know, why play the high risk, high, high percentage risk game by trying to be clever? Don't do it. Just sell the, the, the obvious percentage game. Rule seven, know the racing rules inside out. You need the confidence of knowing the rules so that you can place your boat in tight situations reasonably confidently. You don't have to know them in, you don't have to know every single racing rule upside down, but know the basic racing rules inside out. I'm not going to talk about rules because there's seminars to come on it, but there are only three or four, five basic rules you need to learn. Get them in your head and be confident about them. Rule 8 should actually be Rule 10. I don't know why it came up as Rule 8, but I typed it out the way I'd written it 15 years ago, so that's where it is. Never, 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 ever give up. It's a sailing race. The wind's going to change. The tide's going to change. Um, a lot of you in the room will know Ante Razmulovic, who's one of the best actual sailors in the world. He and I have lots of races against each other. He was going down the run to the finish, spinnaker up in 10 knots of wind. I was 100 metres behind, and I thought, oh, this race is absolutely over. I'll just, you know, relax on the way down to the finish. Start relaxing, look up, and his spinnaker's starting to collapse. <laughs> Absolutely for no reason whatsoever, the wind's dropping. This is in the Solent in England. A minute and a half later, whoa, he's really slow. A minute later, his spinnaker was collapsing. There was no wind, it was gone. Wind was coming from somewhere else. We did two jibes. He still beat us, but only by about that much in the end. Never, ever assume that it's over in sailing. Rule nine. The 10 feet are always important. What are the 10 feet? The 10 feet are the difference between you just crossing the boys on starboard and not crossing them. So you're going along, you're all lined up after the start. If you can go forward just enough, 10 feet say, so that you're able to tack and cross them when you can, as we had earlier in the, in the thing, that 10 feet means that you're heading back to the middle of the race course, back to the opportunities. I've seen so many races won where that 10 feet, just sneaking ahead of this guy on starboard, makes a difference between winning and losing. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Even last week in King's Cup, I was on a 40-footer. There was a 40, another 40-footer sailing, one with my son on. There were a bunch of 43-foot boats. The 40-footer was, I don't know, eight, nine seconds a minute quicker than we were. After two or three minutes of sailing off this direction, he was able to tack on the 40-footer and cross all the big 43s that were coming. We were 20 seconds behind. When we tacked, sugar. Can't cross them. We've either got to duck behind them or we've got to tack this way and get forced away from the middle of the race course. That was specific, he was on a slightly faster boat, but the point is, that 10 feet made such a huge difference. And you can always find 10 feet in your boat, whether it's a flying 15 or a roughy or a sonata. Okay, you can always find a little bit of a gain, just keep sneaking that 10 feet forward. <laughs> Rule 10, ask questions all the time, of yourselves, of other sailors, of sail makers, of old sailors, of young sailors, just keep asking questions. Particularly in this club, there is, and actually in, around the world, but particularly here, no one is going to worry if you come up and ask a question. And, you know, the guys at the front are always going to answer it as honestly and as nicely as they can. Everybody wants the standard to, to go up. So if you're not sure about something, about rig tuning or about boat tuning or about tactics, just go and ask somebody. You'll only get better by asking <coughs> questions and getting the answers. Dad and I were talking about this earlier and we were saying that actually one of the things that my brother and I have been really lucky and sort of privileged to be able to do, being based in Cowes and so on, there's a lot of really top sailors around there. And um, he, my brother and I do quite different types of sailing, but we've both had the opportunity to talk to people who are at the top of the particular class that we were interested in at pretty much any time. And it really is, it makes a huge difference when you can go and talk to someone who's got the Olympic medal or who's sailed around the world or who's done whatever it is that you're interested in getting better at and they can give you 
kind of advice straight from the front line, basically. But as Dad says, pretty much everyone at the top of the sport is happy to answer questions, so it's definitely worth asking. Um, and particularly, I think particularly for girls in sailing, like you shouldn't be worried about sounding stupid or asking a really basic question. You should just go for it. Okay, how are we doing for time, Richard? Carry on. Okay, I'm going to very quickly do some other points that weren't on the original Dad's pen list. Um, we'll make it quick. Practice. As a sport, we don't practice. If you go out an hour early for the next month before the racing, you'll do four hours practice, which I guarantee you is four hours more than your competitors, and probably more than practice than you've done in the last year. Just turn up an hour early and go sailing. Do a few crew manoeuvres, do a few timed runs towards the start buoy, um, sail upwind and look at the wind shifts. It's nothing. It's an hour every Saturday for a month. It'll make a big, big difference. Make sure your boat works. Are the ropes the right length, the right thickness, blah, blah, blah. We went out at Etchell's training last weekend. Half the boats didn't work. Backstays didn't, didn't work properly. Traveller lines were too short. Spinnaker cleat sheets were in the wrong place. It was, it was amazing how little things, I sailed two or three boats that day, it's amazing how little things were so just slightly wrong, but they made a big difference to your ability to sail efficiently. Go and spy on the best boat in the fleet. Take photographs, go home, figure out which systems you, you know, think look good. Ask the other, go, the other guy, which, which of these systems work well, which are lousy. Get the best systems you can, except for Andrew and his laser, which is pretty basic on the systems. But on your J80, you know, you still have opportunities, right? Yep. That's a really big thing. If the boat doesn't work, you're giving yourself no chance of getting that 10 feet. If you don't get the 10 feet, you won't cross the guys on starboard. Your chance of winning the race has gone down. We've just gone from a 4 to 1 purchase on the outfall to an 8 to 1 purchase. We can now get the outfall on after going round the bottom mark. We never used to put it on before going around the bottom. Right. Always forgot. No. That's, a, that's a, a really good example. It costs very little, the time input is about an hour, and the difference in performance will be enormous. Enormous. I had to put on their mindset. Um, decide what your goals are, and change your mindset from accepting where you are into trying to achieve those goals. No, you know, most people in this room are, well, everyone in this room actually, is, is successful at what they do. Nobody lives in Hong Kong and is unsuccessful at what they do. You wouldn't go to work and sit in your office or in your, in your classroom, whatever it happens to be, and just try to wing it. You say, okay, what's my plan? Why aren't I selling enough t-shirts? Why aren't I selling enough petrol pumps? Why aren't I, I don't know, finding the cure for whatever problem it is? You'd sit down with a group of people and you'd try to analyze the problem find solutions, write them down, and get on with it. You need to do the same thing in sailing, because otherwise, you're just going out and you won't improve. You'll just go out and sail up and down the race course. Oh, we didn't do very well. Come back. Oh, we didn't do very well. A race diary. I pretty much kept a race diary, um, I think since I've been about 12, pretty much since I started racing, actually. So um, it's really funny now to look back and look at the tiny problems that I was worrying about at that point, which was things like, oh, I forgot my gloves, and then looking at the bigger things as it kind of went on. But it's a really good learning tool because you can look back at not just the technical problems that you learned, but also just your sort of mental development and the way that you cope with frustration in the boat and when it's all going wrong. And um, it's a really important way of learning, I think. Just actually writing down, even if you sit around with the crew and talk about it, I still think it's worth writing it down afterwards. I think it's one of, the, one of the biggest tools you can get to improve your performance is a, is a debrief. Um, the three guys on the 40-footer, myself, Mark and Nick, the owner, have done about five emails today of, OK, why didn't we win? What, what did we do badly? What was wrong with the crew? What was wrong with the sails? What was wrong with the boat? What was wrong with the rating? Um, you know, that's a pretty well-prepared, pretty well-campaigned boat. And we still came up with, I don't know, nine, eight, nine, ten areas where we can improve by a tiny bit which next time hopefully will get us a little further up the front. Patience. Sailing's a long game. Try to stay calm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to sail against this girl. Um, we, there was absolutely no love lost between us, but in the UK, um, we used to sail
stay on the same fleet against each other pretty much three or four times a week and every weekend. And um, she was better than me when I started. And it, it went on for like two or three years. I could never beat this girl. It just went on and on and on. It was a, it was a real, like, yeah, love-hate relationship there. Anyway, eventually, um, as Dad was saying earlier on, you get into a pecking order in your mind about where you expect to come. And I kind of was expecting her to beat me. And then when we moved into a new class, it kind of leveled the field again. And, um, and I started beating her. And it was a, a patience thing because had to really focus to figure out why she was so good, why she was so much better than me, and this girl in particular, not just other people in the fleet. Um, and then once you do actually break through that barrier and you've kind of moved up a level and you can really tell because you're beating the people that you weren't in the past, um, it's a really good feeling, but it does require a lot of patience and sort of mental energy to figure out their style, so. Okay. This, is, this I think is a really good one. Identify your weakness and give it a name. If you know what it is you do badly, give it a name and then you can avoid doing it. One of my personal strengths on a boat when I'm helmsman is I'm really good at going round marks, I'm good at starting, I'm good at doing all the little weaving around people. Um, you know, I, don't, I have no problem with it. Unfortunately, sometimes I get a bit carried away and I start overdoing it. And exactly when I should be doing the basic, simple stuff, I, I go, oh, too, too far and, and screw it up. So one of the guys I used to serve with used to, ended up calling me a cowboy. So every time we were going into a mark rounding, which looked a bit hairy, he would say as we went in, put your steps in away, Lawrence. And that was enough to make me remember, okay, yeah, I know I like going weaving around small gaps, and I know I think I'm good at it, but sometimes put the steps in away. Don't try to be a, a gunslinger, just do the basics. Do it properly. And you only, had, you only had to say that, and it changed my whole mental mindset to, to what was about to happen. David on, on the etchel likes to say to people before a high-pressure situation, Formula One, which is his code words for, they can change four wheels in under three seconds on a Formula One car, which comes in at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. What we're going to do in this etchel is not that difficult. Just imagine you're a Formula One team. Keep it calm. Keep it steady. So those key words... If you can identify your own particular weakness and give it a word to, to trigger your mind into a new place, that makes a big difference. Learn to trim sails better. None of us know how to trim sails properly. Just keep at it, keep asking questions, keep looking at photos. Oops. Last one. Uh, it goes back to what, a little bit about what I said earlier before about mark everything on the boat with a marker pen. Have a marker pen on the boat, have tape on the boat, calibrate <coughs> everything as you go. And run a little logbook of fast, of fast settings. I think that's more than enough for everybody to, to think about. We'll post those on the internet. Um, more than happy to go through anything that anybody has in the way of questions or particular circumstances, tactically. But if you can just focus on the, the, the 10 key things and do those things better, these things here, uh, I guarantee your, your, your race results will improve. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Before we let him go, are there any questions? <laughs> You said you typed that up 15 years ago. Yeah. And you said you go to Long, which was 13. Yeah. Too much. Right? No, all right, I've got the map. <laughs> <laughs> She's not that old, so I typed it up when she was 11. 11. Okay. How old are you now? 23. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but I did do it a long time ago, and she still got them at home in the bedroom. Her handwritten, I think, is actually true. Yeah. Pre-internet. Very good. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lawrence, thank you. My pleasure. Serious thank you.